I would like to introduce my cohort in this venture, Mr. Ronald Maines, who is the general manager of WTAP TV and radio. And we are here to uh, ask this gentleman questions, and we will be asking questions for the next half hour uh, to 25 minutes. Our guest is Mr. Dernberger, uh, route number two, Mineral Wells, West Virginia. Mr. Dernberger has a very interesting story to tell us this evening. I will give you a thumbnail sketch to begin with. Whether or not you believe in unidentified flying objects or not is not the point. Whether you believe in what you hear or see on this program is not the point. We are here to talk to a man that allegedly did make contact with such an object within the Parkersburg area last evening, November the 2nd, 1966, at approximately 7.25 p.m. The incident allegedly took place on Interstate Highway 77 near the interchange of Route Number 47. This gentleman is a salesman in the area. He has been a resident of the area for the past 50 years, and he has uh, given us permission to interview him, uh, to show his face, and to call him by name. And this in itself takes a lot of initiative and, to be very plain, a lot of know-how. Mr. Dernberger, in your own words, would you please relate what happened last night? Well, I, was, I am a salesman, and I drive a truck. And last night, uh, shortly after 7 o'clock, I was coming from Marietta, Ohio, coming down Interstate 77. And just before I came to the intersection of uh, Route 47, there was a car past me, overtaking me from behind. And following closely behind this car was this unidentified flying object. And as the car ahead, or the car behind passed me, this object was following close behind it, and it swerved directly in front of my truck, turning crosswise. And when it turned crosswise, it slowed down. It started slowing not abruptly or too fast, but it gave me plenty of time to step on my brakes and slow down with it. But it forced me to come to a complete stop. As soon as I had stopped, there was a door opened in the side of this vehicle, and this man stepped out and came directly to me, or came to the truck. He walked to the right-hand side of the truck, and he told me to roll down the window. He asked me to roll down the window on my right-hand side of my truck, and I had done what he asked. And this man stood there, and he, uh, he first asked me, what I was called, and I knew he meant my name, and I told him my name. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, why are you frightened? He said, don't be frightened, we wish you no harm. He said, we mean you no harm, we wish you only happiness. And uh, I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Cold. That was the name that he was called by. And he asked me what the city of Parkinsburg, he pointed to the lights. He didn't point, but he gave the impression that he was pointing, and he asked me what that was called. And I told him it was a Parkinsburg, it was a city, a town. And he asked me if most all the people lived in my, this city or town. And I explained to him uh, that it was a place of business. It's where we transacted our business, that the people lived in communities, outlying communities, most of the people. And when I told him that this was a city, he said that his, where his home was, that that was called a gathering. And uh, again, he told me not to be frightened, which I was. I was, I was very frightened. And as far as I can understand, this was all mental. There was no spoken words from him. I knew what he was asking me, but yet he stood there and his mouth did not move. He had a smile on his face. He, was, he appeared very courteous and friendly. And after I talked with him a while, he told me he would see me. He said, we will see you again. And 
he left in his vehicle. Now, Mr. Dernberger, for the sake of our television audience here, uh, the the words that you used, cold, cold would be like uh, cold is his name. This is how it sounded to you that his name was cold. Yes. And the the word gathering was like uh, we would know together or, or something like this. Yes, that's what he meant. That was the impression that he gave. And he did not move his lips nor utter any sound whatsoever. He he talked with you in, in telepathy then. That was right, that his lips did not move. He uttered no words at all. But you talked. I mean, you, he did Yes, I talked. He told me, he told me twice that I could either talk or I could think which either would be better or easier for me. This was an instant thing. This wasn't, there was no hesitation on his part nor on your part. You knew immediately what he was That's communicating correct. to you, and he knew immediately what you were communicating to him. That is right. Mm -hmm. uh, what did this object, what color was this object? This object was between a real dark gray and black. I would call it a charcoal color. It glistened. And my headlights, my headlights, when it stopped me, my headlights were shining directly on it. it uh, were there lights in it? No, I see no lights of any kind. There was no lights in it. There were windows? If there was windows, I couldn't detect them. I couldn't see them. And when the door, now, uh, you, could, you had a very clear view from behind the wheel of your van, uh, uh, the driver's seat of your van. Yes. He came forward toward you, be, did he tell you, did he communicate to you to roll your window down before he got to the side of your truck? What, was he still in your headlights when he communicated? He was, he was still in my headlights, walking in a, in a kind of a diagonal way across my headlights to the right-hand side of my truck when he told me then to roll down, if I would please roll down the window on the right-hand side of my truck. Uh, now, in the beginning... You were driving south on 77. Correct. From Marietta. Yes. Toward uh, Mineral Wells. Yes. A car passed you. It did. Immediately behind this car, of what distance? I would say between 25 and 30 feet. It was very close to the other car. Uh, it came this object. Yes. Uh, hovering how far off the ground, would you say? Well, when, it, when I first seen it, uh, I... I, I seen it out of the corner of my eye, and I first thought it was just another car, and then I knew it wasn't a car almost immediately, and I turned and looked at it. And I would say it was approximately 30 to 35 feet long, and it came directly across past my truck and immediately turned sideways. It was completely across the two-lane highway. It was completely blocked me. I went partly <coughs> off of the road onto the berm to try to go around it, but I couldn't get around it. it now, let me ask you something. Uh, this, then when it came in front of your car, may I have, uh, the, uh, Mr. Dernberger was kind enough to draw us a sketch of what this object appeared to him, uh, and we'll, we'll let you see it here. Uh, I'm correct then that the, the object came alongside of your car, veered in front of your car, and as you slowed, or your truck, and as you slowed your truck down, the object slowed down, and then when it landed, it didn't land, it, it stayed off the ground. Yes, it was approximately eight to ten inches off of the ground, and as soon as it came to a stop immediately, there was a door on the side facing me open, and this man stepped out. And he started walking immediately right to the right-hand side of my truck. Now, this, uh, that would be then uh, the picture we have on our screen right now. That would, be the, that would be the angle. Your truck would be going right at that. Is that the idea? That's, that's right. right. Now, where would the door be in, uh, in that particular well, object there? It would be right where the large part of the drawing where, starts. Where the hump is? Oh, yes, in the, right in the where front the of the hump. Would it be in this direction here? Uh, back toward the right, th no, that's too far, Mr. Wilson. Back up front farther. About here? Right there. Not even here. Approximately right there. And the door, it, uh, it resembled just an ordinary automobile door when it opened. 
All right. Now this, it, 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 it didn't open from a bottom hinge or a top hinge. It opened from a side hinge. It opened from the... That we know opened. Yes, it opened from the side. How about, uh, would you, how was this gentleman, uh, how was this person dressed? Uh, what what well, type of clothing uh, did he wear? He had a top coat on, and it was zippered down the front. Uh, his top, uh, the top two buttons, like my coat here, were open, and he. This uh, outfit was a, a shiny material. It was a, a glossy outfit, uh, like it was metallic, I suppose you would call it. And his shirt was a little bit darker than his jacket. And below his coat, he had on trousers of uh, the same kind of a cloth material. And I believe the trousers were just a shade lighter than his coat. Which would have been a uh, navy blue, the coat yes. would have been a dark blue yes. coat. Uh, what, about the, uh, what about the texture of his skin, the color of his skin, uh, his eyes, eyebrows, eyelashes, hairline? Uh, what, what were these, uh, what did he look like? He looked perfectly natural and normal as any human being. He had, uh, his face looked like he had a, a good tan, a deep sun tan. He was not too dark. But it was just like he had been out in the sun a lot and had a good tan. His hair was combed straight back, and it was a dark brown. And they, he seemed to have uh, a good thick head of hair. And his eyebrows, his face, uh, his features were no, very normal. Uh, I don't believe that he looked any different from any other man that we'd meet on the street. Now, this ship that he stepped out of, when he came up, when he left the ship and started toward your truck, toward your van, the ship remained there as he walked toward you? Or? No. Immediately that he stepped out of the truck, or out of his vehicle, the door closed and the vehicle lifted straight up. It went straight, just as straight as you could point upward. And it went up, and uh, I did see it, and uh, occasionally as I was talking to this man, I looked up, and it was still there. It was approximately 50 to 75 feet off of the ground, and it stayed there all the time this man was talking to me. Now, when he, did, uh, when he talked to you, did he uh, turn his head away as I'm turning my head away now, or did he uh, stare right at you, or did uh, uh, what, what, was, what he, was his movement? He watched me when he was talking to me. He looked at me directly in the face. But as uh, there were several cars and several big trucks passed, and uh, as these big trucks had passed, he would turn his head and glance at the trucks. But there was no... Uh, did you look at the object in the air while he was talking with you? Did you glance up at the... Yes. I, in fact, I, I leaned forward and looked kind of out of my windshield, and I could see it. It was still... So then this communication that, you, that he had with you would not necessarily depend upon him looking you in the eye or anything like that, then, evidently? No, no, I, he did not. In fact, when he first got out of the vehicle, when he told me to roll the window down, he, it was impossible for him to see my eyes because I was behind my own headlights, and he could not have done it. How old would you say he was? He looked to be approximately 35, 40 years old. He was a very nice-looking man. He was neat. And uh, what specifically did he say to you? What did he say? Hi, it's a nice evening. Or what? I mean, what, why did he stop you? What? Did, what was his? When he when he asked me to roll the window down, which I did, I rolled the window down, and he told me he said, uh, "I would like to talk to you." And uh, I just couldn't answer him. I just couldn't speak. And at that that is the first time he told me not to be frightened. He said he wished me no harm. And uh, he talked a little bit in this vein. He asked me why. He said, why are you frightened of us? He said, we are the same as you. He said, we eat, we breathe, we sleep, we bleed, even as you do. He said, we are like you. He, and he said, please be not frightened. Did he say where he was from? He did not say where he was from. But when he asked me what Parkinsburg was, and I told him, he said it, uh, at where I, where I stay or where I live, my home, he said, we call this a gathering. Did he say anything about him? Did he volunteer? Uh, did, he, did he have a family? What did, what, did, 
did he ask you what you did for a living, where you worked? No, he asked me. He, he asked me if I if I worked for a living. He asked me if I if I had to work to live, and I explained to him what I was. I he even asked me where I lived, and I told him, and uh, I told him that I was a salesman, and he told me that he was a searcher. A searcher. A searcher. But he didn't tell you what he was searching for. No, he didn't. Uh, he didn't offer me no uh, information other than this, but at two or three times he did tell me, he said, Mr. Dernberger, look at me. And he said, do not be frightened, look at me. And I believe if I hadn't have been frightened, I believe that if I had have looked to him, I believe that I could have understood a lot more of uh, what he wanted me to than what I actually did. You but just have this feeling, you mean? But I have that feeling. I... Uh, I, w I was very nervous. I was very upset after this happened. And after I got home and after I had calmed down, I can look back now and I see where I should have asked him questions. And I believe I had the impression that he would have answered these questions readily. Do you believe in flying saucers? I have never have believed in flying saucers before. I, I have heard about them a few times. I have even read in the paper about flying objects, but I honestly never did believe in it. Do you believe in them now? I believe in what I seen last night. I believe it was, I don't believe it was a saucer, but I believe it was an alien, some kind of an aircraft, a spacecraft or something. Mr. Dernberger, we have a program on radio called The Joe Pine Show, and Mr. Pine interviews extraordinary people in various, uh, that are involved in various uh, occupations and, and some non-occupational type of uh, businesses. And have you, have you ever heard of Joe Pine? No, I haven't. Never. I don't believe I have. All right. Uh, on one of his recent broadcasts, he talked with a man, he interviewed a man who had not only had somewhat similar, a uh, somewhat similar experience to what you had last evening, but uh, this gentleman went one step further, and he had taken, uh, been taken aboard a spaceship, which, by the way, was uh, described quite similar, similarly to what you described this particular ship. Uh, and this ship, uh, with these people who looked like we do, and so forth, took him to Venus and took him to Mars and brought him back home again. What, what would you think of a story like that if somebody told it to you? What would you think of the person telling you that story? Would you believe that now? Would you believe that well, that could be possible? No, Mr. Uh, Manz, I believe now that that could happen. If someone would have told me yesterday before this happened, I would have frankly thought he was a nut. But I honestly believe now that it could happen. I wouldn't, I'm, I'm surely not going to say it couldn't happen. Uh, now, these men last night, or this man, he made, uh, gave me no indication that he wanted me on his ship. He didn't ask me to get out of my truck. As I say, he was very friendly and courteous. And, uh, you drink? Do no, you drink? I do not drink. I, uh, other, I mean, you don't drink intoxicating beverages? No, I do not drink any intoxicating beverages at all. I, I don't believe in drinking, and I just don't. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I saw last night, I know that I saw it. It was no figment of imagination. It was there, and I was there. And now, you, you said that uh, he, he also made the statement that we will see you again. When he was getting ready to leave, he stepped back from the truck about one step, and he said, uh, Mr. Dernberger, we will see you again. He didn't say I. He said we. We'll see you again. And uh, when he got in the truck, or when he got in the vehicle, the door opened as he walked up to the vehicle, and he stepped up into it, and there was another man, or I couldn't describe this man because I could just see his outline, but I did see his arm and hand reach outside and take a hold of the door and pull the door closed. And when the door closed, it made an audible noise, like you'd shut a, a door on of a big, heavy automobile. It, what kind of a noise did this 
object make when it was uh, hovering above the ground six or ten inches and and then uh, upon uh, letting the man off uh, and you say it went back up in the air 75 or 100 feet uh, this is a an object now that we're talking about that's nine eight or nine feet high 36 uh, feet long yes. and about eight or nine feet across that's in, right in breadth uh, uh, it would although it's really not too large an object it is a, it's larger than what a an automobile for example yes uh, and to lift something like that would take a lot of uh, a lot of force to do this. What kind of a sound did this make? It, uh, the, the sound when it was hovering over the ground and when it was lifting, I, I couldn't distinguish no difference in the sound. It was a low fluttering noise. It, uh, well, if you've ever heard the uh, blades of a helicopter as it was idling, sitting on the ground, that would be the closest way that I can describe the noise it made, but it was not very, very loud. Can you, can you make a noise that it sounded well, like? Uh, it, sound, it was a fluttering noise. It sounded something like... But, but it's a sound you have never heard before. I had never heard anything like it before in my life. Let's, let's get back to this. Uh, let's get back to the fellow here now. He was how tall? I would say he was close to six feet tall, and he had weighed around 180 or 185. I'm six feet tall. He's heavier he was, than I am. He was about your height. But heavier than what yes, I Yes, he was facial. heavier. His face was more full. His How much do you figure that I would weigh? I'd say about 165 to 70. Uh, you, you're right on the button. That's, that's right. Uh, there were no lights. This was now. This was dark. This time of night, you were. It was dark. It was completely dark. But I never, at any time, turned my headlights off, and I also had the lights in the truck on. I have a, a cab light, and then I have lights back through my truck, mm -hmm. and uh, these lights were on. It gave good illumination up close to the truck, but not too far back. But while he was standing and talking to me, I could see him clearly. And at several times, there was cars passed and trucks passed, and uh, especially cars that came up from behind me, as they came around this bend, they were throwing their headlights directly on the back end of my truck and was throwing a good light on him. But no one slowed down or No one slowed down. Like as but they would have easily been able to see him. Yes, they could have seen him. Do you suppose maybe somebody in our audience might have passed you last evening? Well, standing there talking with this fellow. I know that there was several cars past me, and one car, as this thing settled down in front of me, was coming to meet me. And when this thing was directly in front of me, this car came to meet me. And his headlights were, it was in a kind of a curve. We, this guy came to meet me, would be making a left-hand curve, and his lights would be shining off to the right. But I still think that he could have seen and probably did see whatever this object was. Glenn, I've been monopolizing here. You uh, sneak in with a question. You have some right. questions you'd like to ask? <coughs> I know personally that Mr. Durenberger was scared because I talked to him a short time after this happened by telephone last night. What did your wife think when you told her about this episode? Well, my wife was, uh, she took it pretty calmly, but uh, it kind of made her nervous. She, uh, she worried today before I started back to work. She thought uh, the same thing could happen again, and uh, she believes that what I told her, and she's pretty upset herself about it. This thought communication, uh, which is <clears throat> apparently extrasensory perception or mental telepathy, when uh, was you first aware that this was the way that you were communicating? Well, uh, when he first told me to come, uh, when he first got out of his vehicle and started over to my car, that is when he first told me or asked me if I'd roll down my window. At that time, right at that minute, I didn't know that uh, it was mental telepathy. But when he came to the door and looked in through the window from the right-hand side of the truck, then I realized that he was speaking, but his lips were not moving. Is this the thing that frightened you, that shook this you up? This is what made me, that frightened me more than anything I believe that had happened up until that time, even more so than when I actually seen the 
object. <laughs> and uh, I know that uh, <clears throat> he told me not to be frightened. He was very reassuring in his attitude. He was friendly. He smiled continuously while I talked to him. He kept his arms folded uh, something like this all the time. His, his arms were folded <clears throat> completely at all times. Like I said, his hands were hidden. And at the time I talked to him, I didn't think nothing about it. But after I started home, I did wonder why he stood that way. And as I believe one of you gentlemen asked me before uh, about his hands, when this man closed the door, when he got back into the vehicle, I distinctly seen this other man's hand and arm, and uh, his arm looked completely normal in his hand. Now, you described the, uh, you described the attire of this person uh, more, as a, uh, more as a suit such as I'm wearing, than, than a uniform. Yes. That we I, know is a uniform. I would say that it wasn't a uniform. It, uh, it didn't have, you know, the, the cut of a uniform. It was more like you'd uh, wear a suit uh, to town. Or, was it a cloth like this? Well, it was a bright, shiny color cloth. It looked like a, what my wife calls a hard fabric. It glistened when the lights would shine on it. Uh, a luminous type. Yes. Thing. Uh, the arm that came out, another arm from inside came out to close the door when yes, this gentleman got back. Uh, was that arm clothed uh, in the same type of... Uh, I would say it was identically the same. It, it looked the same to me exactly. Now, he had on, from what you could see, he had on a shirt that buttoned... He, uh, with I, a collar but no tie. He had no tie, but I know that the top button of his shirt at the throat, I know he had a button there. I seen that. I looked at that button. Mm -hmm. His button. Now, his top coat was zippered. It had a zipper on the front of his coat. And uh, he looked perfectly normal. He why do you suppose, <clears throat> why do you suppose that he came around to... Uh, the right-hand side of your truck rather than the nearest side to you. Why do you figure that he came around that side? Well, the only reason that I could uh, give for that was that I had uh, two wheels off on the berm and two wheels sitting on the highway where I'd been trying to get around this before he got me completely stopped. And I believe that this man actually knew the traffic conditions. I believe he knew that he right. would be safe on the other now, side. Now, if of the truck. he didn't use... Uh, words in communicating with you, if he used thoughts, why did he have you roll your window down so that he could hear you? So I did you feel I, that this was why he did it? I believe that he had me to roll the window down so he could look at me without looking through the glass because the glass was very rain street uh -huh. where it had been raining. Uh -huh. And uh, that is the impression that I got, that he wanted the window down so I'd be in closer communication with him or so we could see each other or the uh, the uh, time when he when he left you when he when your conversation was ended how did you know that it was all over how, did he say well that's did he say anything to the effect that well I've got to be going now I have to go I know uh, what did how did he terminate this conversation he, he terminated his conversation very quickly. Uh, one second we were talking there, and the next thing this vehicle settled down right beside, he stepped back from the truck. And the, when he stepped back, this thing came back, back down. Now, it wasn't crosswise the road when it came down. It was heading in the same direction I was. It was right, right the length of okay. the truck. And when it settled down, he turned and walked up around in front of my headlights and back. But just before he started, he said, uh, Mr. Dernberger, we will be seeing you again. You believe he will? Well, uh, I did believe it, but now I, I don't know how to an answer that honestly because I'm afraid he will, and I don't want him to, but I, I have a feeling that he will. You're but, apprehensive that he yes. will see you, yet, uh, yet, Again. You, yet you would probably like the... Uh, experiencing it. Well, I don't, be think, more prepared this time? I don't think that I'd be quite so frightened. I think that I could ask him a few questions. I think I could ask him just about as many as he's asked me now. Well, Mr. Dernberger, we're, uh, 
because of time, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come down here with us.